Thank you so much for tuning in to the Healing Over Everything podcast. I am your host, T. And today I wanted to take a few minutes and really talk about grief and the process of grief. And then I want to give you some insight on the things that I've become privy to as it relates to grief and some of the things that happened to me while I was processing and moving through that particular emotion. So as we know, and I actually heard um, Regina King say this after the passing of her son, she said, grief is love that has nowhere to go, right? And that kind of really hit home for me because you have all this emotion that you've stored up for your child, right? You carried this child for nine months. They grew in your belly and then you begin to raise them into, you know, being a toddler, to being a teenager, to being a young adult, to being an adult. And all of that love that you've had for them throughout those times and generations, you've been able to release that emotion onto your loved one or to your child. And then after they have transitioned into no longer being in this present world, you have nowhere for that love to go, right? And that is kind of a good interpretation of grief. It's this stored emotion that has no nowhere to go, that stagnant energy that builds up in your body. And also what I learned during my grief process, which, you know, I had lost loved ones prior to and, you know, people that I've known prior to the passing of my son, but because it was never so close to home, I didn't understand that that thing that happens where, so let me give you an example. So when my son passed away, you know, initially when, you know, family, friends, coworkers, loved ones, the community, your neighborhood learns of the passing of your loved ones, they, to an extent, they rally around you, right? They may come to visit, you know, give their condolences. You may receive a card in the mail. Um, you know, the church may send a, a package or, you know, they may cook dinner for you for, you know, that week or something, right? There are people that are present in your lives during that during that time, but you really feel the emptiness of losing your person or your loved one after all the dust is cleared, right? So, you know, people were there for the first day, the second day, the third day, and we buried my son fairly early. He was buried within a week of his passing. And, um, they really do disappear. And I understand it to an, an extent because you feel like, oh, okay, the service is over. It's over for everyone else, but you're still in it. And that's one of the things that I had to realize with grief that hit so hard and struck me almost the blow was devastating, really, to know that now I have to do this all by myself, right? And that's hard because I really believe that you do need the love and support of someone to help you along in this journey. And when you lose a loved one, like I said, after the, the smoke clears and the dust settles and the services are done, the funeral is over, the repast has passed, right? People clear out and you're left to deal with all of this emotion, all of this stored love that has nowhere to go all by yourself. And that was something that was, you know, I wasn't the type of person that felt like I needed a lot of people around me throughout my life. I felt like I had my family. I had my husband, my, my son and my daughter. I was like, me and my four, no more. Like I was so um, content in that situation. So when he passed and the people, they were there for a little while and then they disappeared, it was, it was heart wrenching. You know, it was heart wrenching that where's everybody at? Right. So one of the things that I felt was kind of anger and I felt anger because why is nobody here? Right. And then the loneliness 
of having to go through this process alone. And then I was, the anger also stemmed from, you know, seeing everybody else around me still living life, right? Going about their day, doing the things that they do, you know, happiness and, and joy. And they're going on trips and they're posting pictures of their children for the first day of school. And why are their lives going on and I'm still stuck? You know, seeing life go on for everybody else, but not knowing how to really get back into the groove of life is a, is a tough place to be. And that angered me. Like, why isn't everybody else as sad as I am? You know, why aren't they grieving my son as I am? Right. And that kind of infuriated me a little bit. Like, why, why do their lives get to go on? And I, I'm stuck here in my grief and my sadness. Right. I'm crying every day. So seeing other people live their lives while I was stuck in grief made me upset. How dare you smile? <laughs> How dare you have happy moments when my son is no longer here? And it sounds silly to say, but that's something that I felt. And it went on for a really long time. You know, I would hear, you know, people tell their stories about because they have every right to be happy they have every right to be joyous. They have every right to be fully vested and committed to the things that are going on in their lives. But it, it infuriated me because I no longer had those things going on. I couldn't tell stories about my son and, you know, all of the things that I missed out on. And that's one of the things I'm going to touch on. But yeah, I was infuriated that life was going on for everybody else, but it, I was stuck and it was not moving for me. I was angry about that. How dare you? How dare you? That's how I felt. Um, and then another thing that happened with me while I was grieving the loss of my son was I really lost all of my ambition and drive for everything. And the one of the reasons was, is because you really are in a fog. I don't know if anyone's ever, you know, heard of that or talked about, and I'm sure that they have, of course, but there really is a fog that comes over you where you can't think, you can't rationalize, you can't make decisions, you can't, everything that was easy before is so difficult now, you know, just getting up in the morning and making the decision to cook a meal or to whatever the case may be, like you're really in this fog and you have no drive, you have no ambition there is no forward motion, right? And when when you have to go back to work in three days because your employer only gives you three days to mourn the loss of anyone, no matter how close they are to you, it's difficult to get back into it. But really this fog that comes over you, I couldn't I couldn't do anything. Like it, I couldn't remember, like my memory was really affected by it by the loss of my son and by, just by the grief that I was experiencing. And I never knew that that was a, a symptom of grief, right? Um, but yeah, my memory was really, really affected. And even to this day, and it's seven years later, I, I don't feel like I'm 100% back to who I was prior to. I feel like some of my intellect is gone. It, it may sound funny, but this is my truth. Um, I don't feel as intelligent. I don't feel as sharp. I don't feel as um, like I can't retain information as quickly and easily as I could prior to. And I would be really interested to talk to a, a, a medical professional or a psychologist or even a psychiatrist that could maybe explain that process and what happens in the brain. Because I believe that there's something chemically happening um, when you are in grief and going through grief, there's something that, that happens chemically that maybe affects that portion of your brain. But like I said, I, for me, and if you have, you know, suffered or went through grief in any way, you can maybe chime in or, you know, give your experiences, but have any of you all had that happen where after, you know, going through that, that you had some memory um, challenges because I absolutely do. And even, like I said, I don't feel like I'm as sharp. It takes me a little bit longer to 
to really kind of pick up on things. And I'll give a precursor to anybody, like, bear with me. You know what I mean? And I think they think I'm being a little, you know, facetious and trying to be funny or witty or something, but I don't know, like, give me a minute. Like, it takes me a minute now to really process things as before it, you know, I was pretty sharp. I felt like I was sharp. So yeah, I would, I would be interested to see what happens chemically in the brain when it comes to processing grief. But yeah, that's something that I did struggle with. And even also one, another thing, and this is, you know, a big one for me, I struggle to find meaning and purpose now. So for me, and before, before the, the passing of my son, I feel like everybody else, we're all kind of on the journey to finding out what, what's our purpose? What are we here for? You know, what are we supposed to be doing? And I kind of struggle with that, you know what I'm saying? Professionally and, you know, in my everyday kind of, you know, what am I here for? Um, but I had come to the conclusion, and this is actually just another layer of things. I had come to the conclusion that if I could not, figure out my purpose, right? That thing that I'm here to do, that I was content and happy being a mom, right? Like I am happy with the purposefulness of being a mother and depositing into my children and trying to be the best mother that I could be because I don't feel like I started out that well because I was a young mom. I was 16 years old. So I was fully content and prepared. Like, if this is my purpose, then I'm going to walk it out to the best of my ability and I'm going to be the best mother that I can be. I'm going to deposit in my children. I'm going to make sure that they're assets to the community, that they fulfill their purpose in life, that I was really, really okay with that being my purpose. And then my second born child is stolen from me. So it's like now I really struggle with uh purpose and meaning because you know I was settled on that I was really settled and secure in that being okay that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it with diligence and I'm going to do it in excellence right so now I do struggle with that now I understand my gifts right I understand what I was naturally born with what is in my DNA I am a natural born encourager right you know, in, in the, the Christian world, you know, I'm an, an exhorter, right? I have the gift of exhortation. I can affirm you. I can, you know, build you up and I find pleasure in that, right? I am a healer. I understand that I've, I've had testimonies throughout whenever, um, that I have a healing spirit, right? Um, I understand those things and I try to incorporate and I feel like that this that's what this is like I've been given wisdom in a lot of things but really kind of formulating around those gifts what it is that I'm going to do with those gifts to ultimately it's about helping me because my your journey is for self right and if you know you help people along the way you know God bless you um, but I believe that my journey is my journey and those things that I have, those gifts are for me and for others. So I'm trying to figure out how I incorporate my gifts and my talents to benefit my life and journey, right? So that I can get to the next step in the next phase and then also fulfill my purpose because I believe that you are given a tribe of people, right? You're giving, given uh, a soul tribe and your soul tribe, you're connected for reason and for purpose. So you have to figure that out as well. But after the loss of my son, and even now I do struggle with purpose and meaning because I feel like there's a guilt, honestly, if I'm being transparent as I can be, and that's what I'm trying to be uh, with this podcast, there is a guilt with me that if I do what I'm supposed to do, if I find the meaning and the purpose and the, the, the contentment and the happiness that I'm supposed to have, that's rightfully mine, that was, you know, written down in, in my life's story, 
that I somehow am forgetting my child because he's not in it. He's not in that story anymore. And I feel a guilt that, you know, if I, if I, if I'm happy for a moment that God, no, you can't be happy because your son's not here. Right. And I think that's part of the struggle because I, instead of being aware and in who he was when he was here, I'm so devastated by the fact that he's gone that I can't move forward. And that's something that I'm putting on myself. And I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but it makes sense to me because I'm in it. Right. And, um, but that's one of the things that I, I do struggle with, like just finding purpose and meaning and, um, kind of ridding myself and releasing the guilt that I feel for being alive. You know, some people may call it survivor's remorse, right? Because as a mom, you're not supposed to, your child is not supposed to die before you, right? So there's that guilt of, it could, it should have been me. You know, why didn't you let him live? And then, you know, you could have put me in the place. I was older. I had my children. You know what I mean? He, he didn't have a chance to become a father. He didn't have a chance to establish career and, and really live life and, you know, experience things. So you could have taken me. So there's that survivor's remorse and that guilt that as his mom, not only that I couldn't save him, that I could not take his place in the situation. And I know that that sounds crazy. I know that that is not rational thinking, but you're not rational when you're in, when, when you're in grief, when you're in it, you're not rational because of that, that brain fog that I talked about. You're not really formulating clear, true emotion, right? It's just all foggy and it's all muddled. And I know that. Um, but that's my truth, right? I'm, I'm here to share with you how I'm healing on my journey. And the way that I heal is to really do a self-assessment every day. I try to assess myself on a daily basis. And when things come up for me, I am very quick to say, okay, why did I feel that in that moment? What made me feel that way? You know, why did I, why did I tear up when somebody said that? Or, you know, you know, I really try to assess the situation because to me, when I assess it, I'm able to see myself. And then if I can see myself clearly, my, my clear reflection in that moment, then I can make the adjustments that I need to move on to the next phase. Because life is just phases, right? Um, I mean, if you think about it, just, you know, naturally you're a baby and then you're a toddler and then you're a teenager and then you're, you know what I mean? They're phases. And I feel like in order to get to the next phase and what it is that you're supposed to be doing, right? The path that's been laid out for you and you have to go from one phase to the other, from one test to the other, from one, you know what I'm saying? Learning what it is that you're supposed to learn. Um, but that's that's a struggle when you're when you're stuck in grief and stuck is the operative word for me because I literally felt stuck because I couldn't I couldn't do anything I couldn't think I couldn't move I was literally stuck on the couch from January to June I didn't leave the couch I would go in the kitchen maybe get some water but I was literally stuck and I couldn't see my way out of the situation. And, and honestly, I didn't want to see myself out of, out of the situation, see myself out of the situation. Because like I said, I had that guilt that if you pick yourself up and if you find happiness, if you find contentment, then you are not honoring your son. And that's not the case. I'm honestly honoring him because I'm picking up the pieces and because I'm trying to find normalcy and I'm trying to um, trudge along and find happiness. And I believe that that honors him more than sitting in, in sorrow and sitting in grief because I want him to be proud of me. Ultimately, I want him from the space that he's in because I know his energy has not gone anywhere, that he's not here in the present, in the physical form, but his energy is here and he's with me. And I don't want him to see me 
in a place where I am allowing that to be the end of my story. That wouldn't honor him in any way, in any capacity would that honor him. And I think be knowing my son, that he'll be like, mama, what you doing? Because he's seen me, you know, pick myself up from situations. And I feel like I, I have to honor him and do that now, even though it's hard, even though I struggle finding the meaning and the purpose and, and I feel alone and I feel angry and I feel like, you know, how can I do this without you? But I have to, not only for him, but for myself, because I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm still responsible and accountable to do the things that I'm, you know, set to do on, on this life's journey. Yeah. But, and then I also figured out that I have to find and learn new techniques, new ways to finding my happiness. And happiness is, it's all relative, right? It's, it's really your own true definition. What, what brings me happiness uh, may not bring you happiness, but having to find my happy again. And what does that look like? What does it feel like, right? Because as a human being, we are, a lot of our responses are the, the a lot of the ways that our body responds is, is trying to uh, go back to the familiar, right? Whatever is familiar. And that's another thing that I found out when um, my son passed away. So everything changed for me. My entire life changed, but my mind is trying to search for what's familiar and what's familiar for them, for my mind and for my body and for my everything. What's familiar for me is that I had a home, I had a husband, I had a child, I had another child, I had, you know, all of these things and all of that was gone. So mentally I felt crazy because I was trying to go back to what's familiar. That's just naturally, I feel like that's what we do. That's why we stay with people that treat us badly. That's why we, um, you know, we lose weight and we gain it back because even the body is trying to go back to what they, what it knows, right? Um, and my mind was trying to, okay, where is this? No, this isn't right. This isn't right. And I would be in places, literally be in places because after my son passed away, uh, for me, I had to, because I was in a, a space of being alone for a long time, I had to kind of retreat out of that space, right? And I began to travel and go different places, trying to find my happy, but I understood, I understand now that, you know, none of those things would have given me any type of happiness until I dealt with the internal things that were going on. And that's what I eventually did. But I would find myself literally not knowing where I was because I was doing everything different, right? The mind is trying to search for the familiar. The familiar is your normal routine. You wake up in the morning, you go to work, you go to lunch, you go home, you cook, you, you know what I mean? That familiar kind of routine and that set thing, my mind was searching for that. It was like, you're not doing the stuff that you used to do. So what's going on? And I literally felt crazy literally felt crazy. There is something that happens to your mind when you are in grief. I believe that there's mentally something that's going on. There's chemically something that's going on. And I went through all of those things. Um, but yeah, finding my happy again. And that was tough because you, you, you have to know yourself. Like, what makes you happy? And where I started was the things I was looking for contentment first. So for me, contentment was easier to possess than happiness in that moment. So what made me content? You know what I'm saying? What brought me uh, a little bit of peace? And I would always go to a lake by my house and I just felt like a stillness and a peace. And I would do that every day, every single day. 
And then, you know, there was kind of a level leveling off that happened. So, okay. So I did that for a while and then, you know, I searched for other things. Okay. What brings me, you know, comfort. And then I would, you know, make sure that I made my home feel comfortable and that, you know, I surrounded myself with people that, you know, brought me comfort. Like I was literally rebuilding my life from, from scratch because everything that I had, everything that I had known was, was, you know, different. So I literally had to build a whole new foundation and understanding that that was necessary for me to get to the next phase. So it's really a level of commitment that has to happen when you're going, when you've gone through some, something traumatic, you really, the, the, the level of commitment and dedication to get back to normalcy and the, you know, creating a new life and structure for yourself, you have to be willing to get there. And it's tough, right? It's tough. And I know that there's some days where I'm just like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. Like it's too hard. It's, it's, it's so difficult. Um, like I have to do this by myself. Like why, you know, it's the whys. it's the, can I do it? It's the, do I want to do it? It's the, when are you going to send help? all of these things like it's so grief is grief is just it's it's tough it's it's just it's just the worst thing it's the worst thing um but the one that really did kind of just watching people's lives go on that frustrated me so much right how dare they be happy while i'm stuck in my despair and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to kind of share some of the things that the struggles that I had when I was initially starting out in the process of grief and maybe, you know, you have lost a loved one, or maybe you are in a situation where maybe it's not a, a person that you lost, but there were some things that were, um, that you've lost on your journey. And grief is not always for a person. You could grieve over the loss of a job or, you know, there's other things that you could grieve over. It's just really loss where that love has no place to go. Like we talked about in the beginning, right? So something was taken from you and because it was taken, now you have to rebuild and not replace. So don't ever try to replace uh, if, if it's a loved one, right? You can't replace that loved one. So if you lost a spouse or a child or don't try to replace something or put something in the place of that thing because that's going to cause another whole, you know, barrel of trouble. But you have to rebuild a new structure and a new foundation. And you may feel anger, you know, that everybody else is moving on and you're still stuck. You may feel alone because that person is lo no longer there. You may you know, have no uh, true ambition and drive, right? You may have lost your um, true purpose and meaning in life. And, you know, you have to learn to create and find your new normal and find new techniques to be happy. But if you are committed and dedicated to doing that, then you, you're able to. But know that it is a process and know you're going to feel a lot of emotions. But just be committed to it. And I say this every podcast and I may sound like I'm just, you know, saying the same thing over and over, but I really kind of want to beat it in your head that healing is tough, but it is possible to heal from, from situations is, is, is you just have to be committed to it. But those are some of the things that I went through. And those are a list of the things that, um, I initially, you know, had to tackle, right. Those, those, feelings and emotions. And, and I'm still going through it every day because there are certain days that I'm, I'm okay. Right. Like, like I'm good. Like we're, 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 everything's good. And then, you know, I have my moments where I'm just like, why are people still, why ain't nobody as upset as I am that my son ain't here no more? 
You know what I mean? And I know that people's lives were changed when, when, when he was taken from us, right? I know people's lives were, you know, they were changed. I know it because I've heard stories and I've, I've, I've had conversations with people that knew him and loved him. So I know that they struggle as well, but you know, sometimes it, it just makes me upset. It does. I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. Um, and, and my purpose and meaning now is number one is to, to get better for, for me. I also believe that it's, you know, necessary for me to honor my child and to make sure that I stand tall. Um, what I never wanted to be, and I, I don't want to be now, um, I don't necessarily want to advocate for every mother that has lost a child because that the weight of that is is really heavy. And I don't think that I have the real capacity, but I'll support you and I'll hold your hand and I'll be there for you and I'll give you insight. And you know what I'm saying? But I don't want to be the voice of, right? I don't want to be the, the voice of, you know, mothers that have lost children, but I'm in that group, right? I'm in a club that I never wanted to be a part of, but I'm here. Um, but even saying that, like I created this podcast and not just to talk about the loss of my son, right? It's not just for that. It's, it's so many things that I had to overcome in my life, you know, having to overcome so many things and understanding that there are people that are trying to overcome and to heal and become their best selves. That's why I created the podcast. But part of my story is the fact that I am healing from the loss of my child. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm also going to talk about some other things that I'm healing from. But ultimately, it's for my, my greatest good and my highest good. And hopefully in, in becoming my best self, it'll help somebody else become their best self. And they won't have to struggle in grief for as long as I did, or they won't have to struggle in trauma for as long as, you know, the next person that we share our experiences to a certain degree. Um, and that we, we support one another and we do it with consistency and we do it with love and we, we honor the person that's going through whatever they're going to through and don't judge their, their journey. Their journey is theirs and not yours. And what you did, you can share, but don't judge them for taking a different path because we're all, you know, we're different human beings and what worked for me may not work for you, but you know that, oh, well, she told me she did this and you may try it and it may not work, but that's not the end all be all. But just be committed to the process. And if you're going through grief, you know, seek out resources that will benefit you along the way. And that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about in an upcoming podcast is that, you know, there are options out there and I encourage therapy. So if you have not, you know, saw a therapist or spoken with a therapist at any uh, process of your or at any point of your journey no matter what it is that you're healing from, I would encourage you to seek out a therapist, seek out a counselor, someone that you can talk to. That process of just releasing those thoughts and feelings and emotions in, in words to someone else, having someone that's neutral in the situation to really help be a sounding board and give you language right? Sometimes we don't have the language of how we feel, right? Or we don't have the words, but okay, we're not going to go into that. But yeah, just seek out, you know, therapy, seek out resources, you know, surround yourself with people that have your best interests at heart and that want to see you whole and thrive and be better and all of the things. But I do thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I hope Every single time that I get on this microphone, that there's something that I say that inspires you, that encourages you, that gives you hope that I can get through whatever it is that I'm going through, no matter what it is, right? No matter what your struggle is, no matter what trauma you've experienced, no matter the pain that you have, be it physical or emotional, that 
you can get through it. That's ultimately what I want you to leave with every time you hear this podcast, every time you listen, every time you tune in, every time you click on the YouTube channel. I just want you to know that you can get through it. That there is happiness and joy and peace on the other side of your pain. And you may not see it now. And you don't really think that it exists. But I promise you, from a person that has gone through devastation and trauma and grief and all the things, that you can get through it. It's so, so tough, but you can get through it. But I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Healing Over Everything podcast. And we, we leave every podcast and every show with an affirmation. And I just want to affirm you. I want you to hear me. I want to affirm you. You can do this. You can get through the hurt, the pain, the trauma, the grief. It's not going to break you. It's not. It's not going to break you because you're not going to allow it to break you. You're going to see this through to the end. And you are going to find your happiness. You are going to find peace. You are going to find contentment. And that may not sound like an affirmation, but I want you to know that it is possible. Thank you so much again for tuning into the Healing Over Everything podcast. I am your host, T, and thank you so much. And we'll talk soon.